Good, yeah, good evening, students, faculty, staff, and distinguished guests. Thank you for joining us today for this important conversation about advancing health equity in East Africa, perspectives from Rwanda. My name is Omolade Adumbi. I'm a professor of Afro-American and African Studies, director of the African Studies Center, and I'm also a member of the Center for Global Health Equity Faculty Leadership Team. We are pleased to support this interdisciplinary conversation, which is co-sponsored by the Center for Global Health Equity, the African Studies Center, Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, and the School of Public Health. This evening, we have a unique opportunity to hear from, the, from Rwanda's Minister of Health and learn about the important efforts underway to strengthen health systems and advance health equity in East Africa and Rwanda. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Sabin Sazinzimana to the University of Michigan. I hope I got that right. <laughs> exactly, thank you. Dr. Sabin began his service as Rwanda's Minister of Health in November of 2022. Prior to that, he served as Director General of the University Teaching Hospital of Butari and the Rwanda Biomedical Center. He has extensive experience in infectious and non-communicable diseases program design and strategic planning and implementation science. Dr. Sabin holds a medical degree and a master's degree in clinical epidemiology from the University of Rwanda and a PhD in epidemiology from the University of Basel, Switzerland. He has an impressive research record, having served as principal investigator for large clinical trials in Rwanda and multi-country research collaborations. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh in the United Kingdom and the African Scientific Institute. He serves as adjunct assistant professor of global health delivery at the University of Global Health Equity and also teaches clinical epidemiology and research methodology at the University of Rwanda. Please join me in welcoming to Ann Arbor the Honorable Minister Sabin from the Republic of Rwanda. Thank you. Thank you. And joining in the conversation this evening is our colleague, Dr. Joe Colas. Dr. Colas is the director of our UN Center for Global Health Equity and a senior associate dean and professor of medicine. At the end of the conversation today, there will be a Q&A. Some of my colleagues here will be moving around with microphones when that time comes, and I'll moderate the Q&A. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joe to kick off the conversation. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you, Lai. And welcome, uh, Minister Sabin. Um, it's great to have you here. Um, having somebody here from Africa, I was particularly self-conscious with the snow outside today. Um, but uh, Minister Sabin said, when a visitor comes and rain accompanies them, it is considered a blessing that they brought something good yeah, to the area. So true. that was a, a great teaching point for me. I don't know what it means to bring snow with them, but, uh, but, uh, no snow. <laughs> but it's, it, it's probably uh, the same. Yeah. Um, but it's such a treat. Um, Minister Sabin got in um, late yesterday. Uh, we've been spending time um, and uh, comparing notes. I've learned that he comes from the western province of Rwanda. He's the son of a coffee farmer. So he grew up on coffee farms and has moved his way into the illustrious CV that you heard from Lottie. He has uh, three children and um, he's been to the United States in areas such as Maryland, in Washington DC, but he's not been this far west. Um, this is his first trip to the University of Michigan. Um, Minister Sabin, un unfortunately, many of us first became aware of Rwanda during the real atrocities of 1994. I think there were uh, a million people who, uh, Tutsis, uh, largely, that lost their lives in 100 days. And, um, and um, just a, a very tragic time. But I think most recently, there has been what many people think of as a Rwanda miracle that has been going on. 
so many advances in health and in the economy, um, Rwanda is really surging relative to so many of the countries around Africa. Could you reflect on that? Um, why is Rwanda doing so well relative to, to, to other places when it comes to advancing health equity? Well, th thank you, Joe. Uh, good evening, everyone. So it's a great pleasure for me to, to be here. I hope you can hear me yeah. well. Um, so th this is an important question because it defines our, uh, where our country is coming from. Um, that time I was, I was uh, an adolescent. I was 15 years old uh, in 1994. I was just enjoying uh, happy Easter holidays. I was uh, studying in a junior seminary, actually preparing myself to become a priest, uh, which didn't happen. Uh, and actually the change that happened from my personal story uh, was that time. Um, so the, the losing a million people in, in, uh, in three months uh, can seem like um, something that no human being right now can think about. But it happened. Uh, I saw it with my own eyes. Um, and that prompted me to actually join medical field because I felt that time I could not help people. But now I feel I can. Um, because I've been trained, I've met people like, um, like you that at least can think of hope and help. Humanity as one, not as divided. Um, at that time, the, the one thing you could probably tell is how leadership can go wrong completely uh, and destroy a whole country. Um, not just um, infrastructure, but lives of people. Uh, destroy hope of uh, generations that we are feeling right now today, probably even generations behind us are going to feel. Um, so politics of hate were institutionalized for many years until uh, people turn against their neighbors and friends and uh, kill them because um, they're Tutsi because they don't uh, look like them, or because just um, there's hate culture that has been cultivated into our communities. So it happened, it was driven by politics, sometimes um, by the people who would think that they can't, like church leaders, like doctors in hospitals killing their own patients, or their colleagues, doctors or nurses. Uh, we've lost 80% of our healthcare workforce in just three months as part of that um, uh, that is very well known genocide against the Tutsis that happened 29 years ago. Uh, some of the people in the room were not yet born, but the others who were seeing it on televisions as it happened. Um, so it's uh, a story of our, ourselves that we have to tell, but the most important thing is to learn from that and to do uh, what should have been done that time and prevent it to happen again because you look at the stories of uh, similar kind of trends across the world uh, are many. Um, hate, uh, people trying to, to uh, ignore the, li the, the right of living uh, to others uh, and yet you didn't ask the right to be here or to be born somewhere uh, or to look like uh, different. So that is a really a big um, task we have as, as humans, as leaders, um, as doctors, as specialists, as scientists. And, and this, as a university uh, environment, it's even a big task. Because in my country, uh, very few people have gone into university. Uh, but unfortunately, those who went to university also went, uh, participated in those um, uh, um, in the genocide, uh, and they actually activated those who are not in school or to do that. Uh, it's unfortunate and see how our teaching system also adapts to that. Um, are we teaching people those values of respecting life, um, of respecting each other? 
Uh, and that is one part of your question. The second part of your question is the hope, the, the, the story of rebuilding a nation and coming back as a broken nation. Our social tissues are completely destroyed, coming back to live together. Uh, didn't happen by, by miracle uh, or by chance. There are few people who stood up and fought for that. Um, and those sometimes they are fewer than those ones who are trying to destroy. Uh, but the courage that goes with uh, the few who want to do well uh, should prevail um, and must prevail always. That is what we've seen um, from an economy completely destroyed, a health system that was uh, completely down, uh, that 20% of healthcare workforce only remained. When diseases have gone to the highest level of imaginations, cholera outbreaks of the history of the last decades was happening at the same time, both in Rwanda but also in neighboring countries where uh, about four million people fled uh, post-genocide when the, um, the RPF um, led by our current president, uh, His Excellency Paul Kagame, uh, was leading a small army to fight the genocidal regime that uh, was finally um, uh, actually the, the, the genocidal lost the, 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 the fight. There are millions of people that have dragged in so many uh, groups of um, armed or unarmed genocidal with a military and uh, police that was four, five times more in numbers uh, with uh, the, the RPF army that was trying to stop the genocide. So within three months, um, the, the genocide was already taking 75% of the Tutsis communities in, in Rwanda. Um, and also and everyone else was trying to, to oppose that. Uh, uh, so uh, my own story happened that I also found my way out of Rwanda in, uh, in what I call a miracle, uh, to be uh, in, in, in Congo for a few months and then to return back to Rwanda when the, the genocidal regime was completely, um, uh, they had fled the country. He went into different countries in East Africa, mainly in Congo, that time was called Zaire, in Burundi, in Tanzania, um, and they spread across other countries up to southern Africa. Um, and later on, it was not the end of, of the game because they continued to attack back into Rwanda and so many other lives were lost that time. So I joined medical school later on. Um, and I didn't expect myself to be um, in charge of the, uh, the whole sector, uh, health sector. Um, but this is something I'm very, uh, uh, I would say, is another personal miracle to be in, in a position because I was, I was supposed to not exist that time. They lost more than 90% of my family uh, during the genocide. Um, my father and my two sisters managed to escape. Uh, they lost my mother with my five siblings. And when we returned back, we created a new life, uh, trying to, uh, to live for ourselves, but for all others who we lost. But we made, uh, I would say, four choices that drove all of us as a nation forward. One is to be together. Uh, my president always said that we've been divided enough for the past history that be together. Um, there's no Tutsi, there's no Hutu, there's no Twa, there's no foreigner, there's no Muzungu, there's no white or yellow or black. We, we won. We are one. That is even Rwanda was open beyond abolishing the ethnic affiliations, but also opening to the world. So you can fly from any part of the world and get your visa at the airport. You enter Rwanda, you start your business. That is the openness that also helped us to think beyond small divisions that were driven by people with uh, bad intentions to divide, 
but to be together. Number two is to be accountable of what we do so that we keep respecting ourselves, our lives, and what we were supposed to do to build ourselves. And number three is to think big. Uh, sometimes you look at geographical size of our country, is the size of the state of Michigan. Um, but being a small geographical location doesn't limit ourselves to be citizen of the world and even beyond. So we're thinking in the universe context, not in a small context of our geographical locations. And number four is saving lives. So having lost a million, we committed to, uh, to something like no life will be lost again if we can save it. And that drives our sector and health sector that we can do our best to save the life, to prevent diseases, to treat, to care, and even support. That doesn't mean people are not uh, losing their lives, but if we can, uh, we must do that. So that is where the courage of moving comes from. Um, we've come far. We're still working hard to keep our commitment forward, but uh, we still have a lot to do as a country, as a nation. Um, last, last month we got a life expectancy report uh, published from the census. 13 million people. Life expectancy is now 70, 70 years, 70. I think in the U.S. is around 80. Um, we expect in the next four years we'll be reaching 80 as a life expectancy. It's almost more than double of what we had during the time of genocide. So there's hope that we can do even better. We appreciate uh, partnership. Yeah. Michigan is our partner, so that's why we came here. Well, thank you, and we're, we're, we're so honored to be um, in partnership and, and learning with you. Um, you're the Minister of Health. You're at the top of the health sector. Uh, and again, there's so many good things going on in Rwanda to feel good about. But what are your biggest challenges right now? Uh, when you, um, you know, are, are, are lying awake at night and, and struggling with the problems, you can't always look back on the success stories. What are the big challenges you're wrestling with right now as Minister of Health? Wow. Um, so that, that is the same question I asked myself when um, uh, I was nominated Minister of Health. First of all, I, I, um, I spent a few, a few weeks uh, asking, uh, am I going to, to handle this task, um, given that um, it's, it's, it's not an easy one? But we, we've seen um, all the story I talked about, what we went through. Um, I've been in the sector for 18 years in different positions. Um, but when you are not in a position to make such kind of level of decisions and, and, and strategy and directions, uh, you may think that someone is taking care of that until you, you are in that position and you have to. And everyone is waiting for you to yeah. set, show us the direction. What do we do? And there's a lot happening in the sector, especially health sector from a country that is dealing with all these uh, struggles and history. Um, you, everything can, can seem a priority. Everyone is bringing something, malaria, TB, HIV, uh, food and drug regulatory programs, hospitals, everything is coming in your eyes as, as a priority. We need to sit down and make priorities among priorities. And also avoid to be trapped in what I've been doing before as a doctor, as a researcher, as a uh, scientists looking at my numbers and my papers, uh, my works, then my program. Now it's the whole family, the whole sex, no longer a small room, it's the whole house you're looking at. So we, we, we sat down with my colleague, Minister of State, um, that 
we also, both of us were appointed at the same time last, uh, last four months. And we developed like top 10 priorities we are going to focus on because we cannot focus on a thousand things at the same time. And the 10 things we found that actually are capturing everything, if you see they are connected to, to each other. Um, we realized that the most important priority for us, for the sector, is people. And when you talk about people, is the people who are going to, to help us solve the many other thousands of problems we are dealing with. So that became our priority number one. How do we train healthcare workers, workforce, that is capable to deal with these problems? And when you talk about healthcare workforce, is from the community, community health workers. Currently, we have 58,000 of those, uh, two to three to four per village. And these are the ones who have been trying to fill the gap of 80% I talked about. We lost. Up to the health center, we have nurses who are managing the, 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 the next level. Then you have district hospitals. <coughs> these are doctors who are now having complicated cases. Then upper levels, you have uh, advanced care, teaching hospitals, uh, university hospitals. So at each level, we have huge gaps to fill in terms of uh, well-trained personnel and also retained because you, you, you don't want to train people and lose them. Um, and we realize that we have a ratio of one healthcare work per thousand people. That is the ratio for our country currently. The minimum acceptable that the World Health Organization has been defined that everyone should have at least is four per a thousand. So we must multiply four times our current workforce to reach the minimum acceptable, which means our existing staff are, are working four times more to what uh, they expected to do as human beings. Uh, this brings burnout, working overnight. There are people who are staying on the shifts uh, almost 24 hours. We have only four neuro four, five neurosurgeons in Rwanda for the whole country with all the traffic accidents. Some are staying in the hospital like, for, the, for the, almost the whole life. But we also we need to protect them we need to care for them. So this is our priority number one. How do we quadruple our healthcare workforce within the shortest possible time without compromising the quality of care? And then we'll have the minimum level to move forward. So other priorities are linked to that. People need tools, they need to have data, evidence, facts to make good decisions, to be more efficient. You need to focus on the main killers. Those diseases are taking more lives. We used to have TB, malaria, HIV. Those are infectious, take, taking more lives. Currently, things have shifted. Now cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, they are the most killers now. So we are shifting our own programs as disease shift themselves, as lifestyle changes. Uh, the lifestyle here in the in, in, in U.S., was a bit different from our own lifestyle some years back. Uh, but things are now almost mixing up. So we, we are dealing with double epidemics. Infectious disease, disease of, uh, related to poverty and malnutrition, we're reducing significantly as the economy grows. But they are not too much, too, uh, they didn't disappear. They are flattened. Now we're seeing non-communicable disease increasing. So we're finding ourselves, how do we balance this, reducing this increasing new pandemics, while we keep also the previous challenges down. So it's a mixture of many priorities, but we, we believe that things are done by people. If you have well-trained workforce, um, they can drive these changes. So priority number one, healthcare workforce. Very good. How do you think about avoiding the mistakes we've made 
in the United States with our healthcare system. Um, I'm always nervous being a partner in bringing some of our problems to other areas. But um, we've got the world's most expensive healthcare system, but we're only ranked 37th in the world in terms of quality. We've got tremendous inequities and we haven't seemed to have gotten the balance right between population health and um, high-end care in the last year of a person's life. Mm -hmm. um, how can you avoid those mistakes in terms of uh, that balance in the portfolio between population-based health, prevention, primary care, and really high-end expensive care mm -hmm. that maybe gets people a few more months of life? Wow. Um. I'm not calling it a mistake. Uh, I, I just remembered that I'm a Minister of Health representing a, a, a country. But uh, we're learning a lot from um, different healthcare programs across the world. There are things that we're learning from the United States, uh, but also there are things that we're learning from elsewhere. But the, the point you, you're making is important. You don't need to have uh, to, to develop one part um, of a, a system or, or a sector and forget another part because it's a complete, it's like a human body. Uh, you don't want to have uh, legs and um, arms are not developed as the same as your legs and your head, you know. Uh, it has to, find, to be a balance between primary health care, uh, strong enough to detect, prevent, and manage diseases that don't need to go to upper levels, um, and that is more efficient um, than waiting until, if it's uh, high blood pressure, instead of coming it as a stroke at uh, a managed stroke at tertiary level, that is more expensive, less results, uh, more complex, and sometimes um, doesn't doesn't help any 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 system. So. I don't know much about the healthcare system here, but what we are trying to, to do is do developing our, our tertiary healthcare system as we develop our primary healthcare system. Community health workers have managed diseases excellently, like malaria. 70% of malaria are treated by community health workers. They managed to reduce malaria burden. Last five years we're having more than six million, five to six million cases of malaria every year in Rwanda. In malaria, if you don't treat, you're likely to die in the next three days. Uh, so it was killing mothers, children, as every household would, would just record case, a case, especially children. So we, we had to decentralize malaria detection and treatment up to the household level, to detect high fever, could be malaria, a rapid test, confirmed, you give treatment, within three days, you're back to work. So that has happened, and we found we need to do more than that. Um, currently, we, we are actually integrating NCDs, non-communicable disease detection and treatment, at the community level. By, it's a new program we're developing, haven't yet uh, uh, scaled up, but giving BP machines to community health workers, our communities don't, don't know. Uh, I don't know if there are people from, from Africa in this room. Uh, they, may, they may tell. Only a third or less know their uh, numbers, like BP, sugar, uh, and, and the other indicators. So now we have to educate them that you need to know your numbers because you are discovering people with very high blood pressure at the hospital level or because they had stroke or because they already... Uh, in, in coma. So that is primary health care, containing diseases before they become complications. 85% of um, diseases are treated at health center level or below. That is our current numbers for us. So we, we want to raise it to 95%. So that 5% will be treated at hospital and university hospital levels. Those are advanced care, 
these are uh, cardiac surgery, uh, renal transplant, um, and other advanced case management. And we are not forgetting that our history has left behind many other complications like mental health problems, um, like depressions, like uh, post-traumatic syndrome disorders and others. Those are also another heavy burden to our system that you don't want to weight it at a tertiary level, how to manage at community um, level uh, by training uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, and, and, and others. So um, we are learning from good experiences, um, but to me there is no, there's no bad experience in, in terms of learning. So you just pick uh, good things and then you build and you find a balance. Mm. Did I answer your question? I tried. In your, so <laughs> you're a minister of health. It was so politically smooth. You know, I was giving you an invitation to, to, to bash the United States, and uh, you didn't take the bait. Um, but, um, but I can say from the United States, the things that I'm learning from Rwanda is just the power and the promise of the community health workers. Yes. And um, these are individuals who are embedded in the community. They don't get paid, but they get valued for who they are and what they do and that point of pride in terms of serving their communities. Mm. And um, boy, I wish we could do that here. So uh, there are, are things that I'm definitely learning from Rwanda. So um, another thing I've often wondered that I wonder if you could speak to, you know, um, you know the story of the genocide, um, so much of Rwanda was abandoned by, um, by friends and people who could be helpful. And I'm sorry to say we've just lived through another um, episode of that with COVID. Mm. Um, you know, we were um, very good at um, the, the privileged world, the high income world. We're very good at getting the vaccines and make sure that they got them first. And I felt so self-conscious traveling through Africa you know, with my third booster, when so many of the people didn't have a chance to have access to COVID vaccine. Again, I know Rwanda did so much better than other African countries, but how did that look through an equity lens? What was going on with the COVID vaccine and the privileged world versus other places that really, um, you know, called to mind, what is equity here when you've got a, a pandemic that is taking over the world? Great. Um, th thank you, Joe. Uh, I think it, it's, it's another good lesson that as humanity we need to, um, to learn from another tragedy. Um, the genocide against the Tutsi, as you rightly said, has, been, um, has happened when the, the, the leaders of the world said never again uh, uh, after um, the, the uh, other genocide that previously happened uh, uh, for Jews and, and the others. Um, but unfortunately it happened and it happened with the United Nations uh, presence, army presence in my country. Uh, I didn't tell the whole stories but I'm sure most of people in the room have read about the story um, where the United Nations Army abandoned people uh, live to the killers um, in, in the capital of Kigali just a few years back. So COVID came um, almost 25 years after. The country was rebuilding itself. We we're trying our best. Uh, but it took us a little bit behind. Uh, the pressure on the healthcare system, not just Rwanda, but also other countries that were uh, trying to develop to build their healthcare systems. Uh, the, the, one of the lessons, again, from, from COVID-19 pandemic, which is still going on, it's not yet over, is that solutions of pro our problems should be built within our own uh, settings and countries, uh, relying on someone else to come from far and help solve or deal with your problems may not be the best 
approach. Although we live in, in a world that should be um, supporting each other, but sometimes it doesn't happen, actually, if not most of the time. Um, so I remember we, this also happened when I was uh, I'd say at the forefront of the response uh, leading uh, National Public Health Institute, uh, which is known as Rwanda Biomedical Center. We had to ask to outsource everything. PPEs, uh, even basic tools, medicine, for other diseases, everything stopped overnight. Our whole supply chain system in the country paralyzed just because every country was issuing, nothing is going out. Major supplies of the world, of countries, stopped. So we had to find solution within, within our, our borders only, which was difficult. Uh, but what we did, because we, we had had the same experience before, we said now we are on our own, so let's um, find local solutions. That is how we tried to do um, uh, testing in the lab by developing our own uh, testing models, um, like the pool testing that we later on developed. You can test uh, up to 96 samples on, on a plate. But you can also multiply by 20 times by mixing different samples in one tube. There's a method called pool testing that we developed in our lab because we are desperate uh, on so high volume of samples in the lab we couldn't handle because our capacity was very limited. So our lab scientists with our mathematical modelers sat together and developed a model. Uh, later on, we we demonstrated it worked, then we published it uh, in, in, in Nature. Then a few months later, uh, you started to use the same model here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So solution doesn't always come from developed countries towards uh, developing countries. It can also come from developing countries to developed countries, because it's about people uh, who are thinking about a problem and develop a solutions. Uh, so we've seen that opportunity also to innovate, to think, and to put something that is helpful to the world. Um, so inequity has been clear, especially when vaccine were being developed and distributed. I always look at the map. Uh, I wish I could have brought it, but everywhere else is green, access to vaccine, but there's a little continent in between with uh, an orange and, and, and red uh, colors that uh, access is less than 50% or even less than 30% because we produce only 1% of vaccines um, globally and we consume more than 25% of vaccines the world produce. Um, so we managed to be the little green in the massive um, orangish and, and, and uh, other colors because of that um, commitment that we must go beyond our limitations, must push hard and get what we must get. Um, so it, it shows that um, leadership and science, when you stick, you stick on that, uh, leadership, science, community, and communications. These are the four drivers of what we've been implementing during the pandemic. I'm not saying that we've done miracles by responding to our problems. Uh, but at least what we're doing, at the end of the day, we looked at, oh, it worked. So let's work on something else. Um, I remember during COVID, uh, our president asked us to, 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 to show the evidence, what we found in the lab every evening. Um, while in our neighboring countries, there are some reports saying, no, COVID doesn't exist. There's no COVID. That's early days. When we published the first case, we were asked, are you sure you're not going to have problems? Did you, did you confirm that you have COVID? COVID is going to stop everything for you. Uh, tourists, uh, travelers will be banned and, you know, so that beliefs that when you show a problem, when you're transparent, transparent with science and facts, becomes a problem to yourself, 
happened to us earlier before we even see uh, this uh, micron variant when southern countries in, in, in Africa reported the case, then no one wants to fly there after. But f for us, it was a way of saying, okay, we've, this is what we saw, how do we deal with that problem? So it's always good to see uh, political leadership trusting in science. When the opposite happens, you always go wrong. So we're lucky to have that link where the, the president asks, what did you, what does science tell about what we are dealing with? And you are very proud as scientists to go out and say, oh, nice graph statistics, this is where we are. What should we do? We do lockdown for two weeks, then we see, then we collect data, then we see. That is the life we went through. Uh, of course, lockdown was not very popular to many people. That brings the other aspect of how do you tell the community the science in a way they have to understand it. Um, if you say, okay, um, uh, reproduction number, uh, p-values, they not understand. But you have to tell them, you tested 100 people, 20 are positive, we must stop a little bit until we get less than five. If we are less than five, we open, and we open, we trust. If you get above, you tell them, have you seen that? We are above 20. They were always telling us, we know that you're going to do a lockdown next day, without even us announcing it. So that was a, an interesting observation of how community, when is informed by the fact, the science, and the science is trusted by the political leaders, and the communication is clear and transparent and proactive, you always get to get it right. But if you miss one element of that connection, you always go wrong. So at least that is something I've seen with uh, my own eyes in COVID, uh, and I wish it continues. Great. Thank you, Minister. Um, Lottie, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm sure there are questions in the, uh, in the audience. All right. Thank you very much. So at this time, we would like to take uh, questions from the audience. I have my own questions, but uh, I'll let the audience ans ask uh, theirs first. So we'll take a couple of questions, then we'll ask uh, the Honorable Minister to respond to that. And if there's still time, we'll take more. Thank you. Uh, Thank please you for the... uh, just tell us your name. Yes, you know. uh, so I'm Sangeeta Khanna. I'm a physician at, I'm an ophthalmologist at Kellogg Eye Center. Uh, and I, uh, my question is pertaining to training. You talked about training um, medical personnel and physicians and ophthalmologists. So I did part of my training in India and then trained here again. Uh, what I notice is there's a combination of public and private universities, uh, both here and in India. How is it in Rwanda? Is it a combination too? Yeah, it's a combination. And, and we, again, like to see the positive part of that combination. Uh, because the, the private sector brings a lot of uh, uh, aspects in, 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 in teaching. And most of innovations come um, from, from, from the private sector. Uh, but also the public sector brings uh, the sustainability part of it and the tradition of keeping that uh, kind of standards and rigor that we've seen in, in um, academic institutions. Uh, but for us as a health sector, we have a framework of um, coordination where private, public, being a training institution, being a clinic, a hospital, private or, or, or public, we, we meet quarterly. Uh, under the leadership of the Ministry of Health, because we are not a Minister of Health for public sector. We are Minister of Health for the, for the, for the country, for the people, because um, we are one government at the end. So that is what we, we, we kept as an approach of training. If you're being trained in public or private, the standard should be the same, and it should be contributing to the same um, uh, health sector strategy. Uh, and I, I, I think it's the best way also to unite people, uh, given the, the history and the being togetherness that I talked about. Yeah. So can I ask a question? Is it a, a problem to have public and private? I, I just want to understand if 
where you came from, uh, where um, you saw in India and here it's different. So I have also the chance to ask questions, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, no, certainly not. As um, I, I think uh, in India, uh, um, I did see um, that there could be variation in the level, the standard of uh, education, um, and uh, and I think um, in U.S. Uh, the, those um, the the, rig the, ri the rigorous um, there there are various ways to try to optimize that, and just like you mentioned, that's your goal to uh, make sure that. We all meet the standard, whether it's uh, but that co the combination allows more a student or more more physicians to get training. So, yeah. thank great, you. thank you. Uh, Christian Davenport, public policy, political science. Um, so, uh, sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, Christian Davenport, political science and um, public policy. Uh, I have a variety of different questions or comments, but, but two come to mind initially. You allude to a partnership. I'm just curious if you could actually identify exactly what the nature of the, the partnership is between the, the two institutions. Um, and second, I'm curious regarding the equity issue. If it's illegal to identify one's ethnicity in like the census or when you go into a hospital, for example, I'm just curious how you'd be able to ascertain if there's any kind of like ethnic specific health problems? Oh, those are tough questions, <laughs> uh, especially the last one. So actually, we, um, we don't, you, don't, you don't have these ethnic affiliations uh, anymore in Rwanda, at least for the last 29 years, uh, because they were used in a way that uh, no one wanted to see it happening again. Um, and from, from health perspective, it's even uh, un unnecessary to do studies related to ethnic affiliations because these are the same people living in the same village, sharing the same thing with intermarriages. Everything is almost shared other than people who tried to group them in different ways because of, um, I believe, the hate, but also the politics motives in, of the past. So that, for us, in a health research perspective, we don't see that. And even anyone doing research in, um, in the health sector, uh, a few tried to, 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 uh, to look into that in the past, but there was no such uh, a difference that should be uh, included in uh, research projects currently. Um, your first question about partnerships. Um, I think the partnerships has been one of the key drivers of the last three decades in, in the progress we've made. Um, and the first thing has been finding the right partners. You share the, the same values and the, uh, the motive to achieve and move forward. Um, it doesn't, it didn't happen always the way we, you, you, you think it could be. Um, I remember in my early uh, area, um, uh, when I joined the career, uh, that t around 2005, we had 200 partners in HIV program only. Hmm. And of 200 partners, that, that time we had 150 patients receiving antiretrovirals. So each patient has an organization, a partner, <laughs> taking care of him or her. And all of them were in Kigali, the capital of Rwanda. So the, the, the government uh, called them, uh, the Minister of Health that time, and said, you can't all stay in the same place dealing with 150 patients while there are thousands of others waiting to be initiated on treatment. Then they started to assign them different places. And of 200, 25 decided to leave because they didn't want to, to go outside Kigali or to enroll new patients because they had their own agenda and programs. So that is the time we started to do one strategy, one plan, one evaluation, 
and then partners come to plug in instead of each partner bringing a plan uh, for implementing the way uh, they want. Imagine sitting here in Michigan developing a strategy to improve the health sector in Rwanda without us involved in the, that, even knowing what problems we have back home. So that happened many, many times. So today, we are very proud and happy to have partners who are coming and sit with us and say, what are your priorities? Like your, your, your question you asked. Uh, and there, you can go and sit down based on your priorities. I think we can help you or work with you in this field. So this is the partnership we, we, we are having now. And we want to do more partnerships with the University of Michigan. The whole day we've done a marathon of meetings, <laughs> um, trying to identify areas where we can work with you. And I believe that it's not my last time coming here because we'll be coming to see how the partnership are evolving. And also you all invite you to, to come to Rwanda uh, with you. You've, you've been to Rwanda before. Uh, you, you're welcome back Thank you. soon okay. and bring all of them so we can do things. <laughs> okay, we've got okay. time for maybe one more question. Thank you, Honorable Minister. That was uh, very insightful. So my name is Brahano. I'm a PhD student in epidemiology. I'm originally from Ethiopia. My question for you is, so you've shared a lot of experiences regarding like, you know, strong, foundation in, like in data science, at least like you know, when you're making decisions. Is there a forum for like, uh, sharing these experiences among other African countries like Ethiopia? Uh, I feel like, you know, um, like for example, I was actually about to do a study like you know, in Kenya. There is like, you know, uh, in terms of data sources and stuff like that, it is not that organized. So do you guys have, uh, like uh, with other ministers, a forum where you actually share like um, good experiences, workable experiences, and and then how would you help like other students also to get involved like you know in, in studies? Again, again, I'm not talking about uh, other countries' programs because we are learning from each other, but uh, we we have forum, we have um, different frameworks of exchanging and discussing. Um, and actually, we were hosting uh, uh, meetings in Kigali. We were talking about how our community health worker program can be uh, also helping other countries who have faced the same challenges we had. Um, data science or data in it itself is a critical uh, area that we must invest in. Um, we were, last night, we were talking about uh, planning or, or implementing or deciding without clear data, without data for a policymaker or any leader. It's like walk, walking in the dark, eyes closed. So you don't know what you're going to hit or what is going to hit you. So uh, sometimes research and, and science and data and data systems themselves have not been that much considered as a priority. And you end up spending a lot of money because you don't know exactly where to put your resources. And that is, for us, uh, the reason why we're investing in data science, in data systems, knowing exactly what is happening. And it makes even our life easier. If you sit in a big room like this, then you can see the whole sector in front of you. Uh, there's no minister of health who will not, actually minister of any sector, who will not be happy to see the whole data happening in front of uh, of him or her for decision making. So we, we, we share that and also go and, and learn where other good things are happening because we don't have uh, the best practices on everything, but we have some good things to, to share and to learn as well. All right, we've come to the end of uh, uh, the program. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today and please let's put our hands together for the Honorable Minister Sabin. We appreciate uh, <laughs> We really appreciate your coming to share your experience and perspectives on uh, health equity in uh, Rwanda as well as East Africa with us today. So um, please uh, everyone join us for refreshments in that corner.
and uh, also an opportunity to chat with uh, the Honorable Minister. So thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.